The Roman philosopher Seneca is attributed with saying that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. I mean, that sounds good and all, and would probably look pretty great on a poster, like some other sayings. But it's ultimately little comfort to someone who's been beating their head against a wall, submitting and writing cue after cue, yet seeming to get nowhere. Well, as it turns out, Science may have an answer, and on today's episode, we're going to turn to the research of Dr. Richard Wiseman, Professor of Public Understanding of Psychology at the University of Hertfordshire, who studies the psychology of magic and illusion, deception, luck, and self-development. And we're going to examine his four principles of luck and discuss how they might apply to us as production music composers. Plus, we're going to take a listen to a solo piano lullaby cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week, we're gonna be taking a listen to Sleeping Baby, which is a solo piano lullaby cue written by Yuka Reschke. So you definitely want to stick around for that. Uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad you found me, you know, however you found me. I know you have a ton of options out there. Whether you're listening as a po audio podcast or watching me on YouTube, I want to thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and the community going. We are 100% supported by you, so you're not going to hear any ads for meal plans, earbuds, or phone apps. But if, if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52Qs and also unlock extra perks like music production live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking about that a little bit later in today's episode. Is it all luck? Is this whole industry luck? I mean, and there's something to be said about, you know, preparation and preparedness, but it feels like we don't have a lot of a lot of say. We don't have a lot of agency with uh, with regards to getting our big break. I mean, how many stories of, of actors or entertainers or, or successful creative individuals, sports athletes, are, are, are the origins of their story is, and then I was discovered, and then this happened, and suddenly someone heard my music. I mean, my own story is not dissimilar to that. I was putting my, my music out on, on SoundCloud, and someone heard it who had a connection with a library, and off we go. But I think there's more to it than that. And I think that we have more agency, meaning we have more say in the whole process than maybe we want to let on. I mean, there's obviously an element of chance to this because there's just so many people connecting with so many people, but just like just like uh, winning the lottery, your chances improve with the more tickets you buy, I think there is something, there are things that we can do to help things along. So what I want to do today, instead of just kind of pontif pontificating about the different aspects of luck, I actually want to bring in some research. And I want to specifically call in the research of Dr. Richard Wiseman, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Hertfordshire in England. And, and he has outlined four principles of luck. Four principles of luck. And I'll have a link to his website, including his academic papers and all of that, because his WordPress website, his WordPress website has this outlined as well as all of his sources. He cited his sources and where it's found and all of that. But I, I want to talk about his principles of luck. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm just gonna outline them and then we'll unpack them one by one. Principle number one. 
maximize chance opportunities. Principle number one, maximize chance opportunities. Principle number two, listen to your lucky hunches. Principle two, listen to lucky hunches. Principle number three, expect good fortune. Principle number three, expect good fortune. And finally, principle number four, turn bad luck to good. Principle number four, turn bad luck to good. So I want to start with principle number one, which is maximize your chance opportunity. Now, Dr. Wiseman says, lucky people are skilled at creating, noticing, and acting upon chance opportunities. They do this in various ways, including networking, adopting a relaxed attitude to life, and by being open to new experiences. And this is one of the key ways that I feel that we as production music composers have some element of control, some agency in the luck that we experience. Acting upon chance opportunities, including networking, adopting a relaxed attitude to life, and by being open to new experiences. For example, networking, putting yourself into the position to where your music can be interfaced, interacted with, uh, experienced, stumbled upon, however you want to think about it, inserting your music into the places, inserting yourself into the places where it's going to have a significant better chance of being heard. This is ultimately what Taxi does. Taxi is about increasing the likelihood of your music being heard by, you know, you submit to Taxi, you submit to the brief, and you get through the first round of screening that goes on. What well, You have agency in that. Someone who doesn't ever submit to Taxi probably has less of a chance of getting their music into the hands of libraries than someone who does. Now, I'm not saying that taxi is the only way to do that. We've talked long about taxi and all of that. But taxi does increase the opportunity chances. Also, doing things like going to the production music conference that I just went to in September. I'm going to the road rally here in a few weeks. This is creating networking opportunities. You're going to a place and inserting yourself physically in an arena that is charged for connection points. That is that that the, the people that go to these conferences, I noticed this at, uh, in at the PMC is people are ready. You give them your business card, you give them, you know, your, with a QR code and the playlist and everything, they're they're ready to go. They're ready to take it. It's a super fertile soil for you to start sowing some seeds and planting some seeds and seeds of relationship. And they happen as handshakes in the hallway. They happen at conversations over coffee or more likely over beers in the evening. I know I have at least one just in the few weeks since we've been back, I have one new library connection who now wants an album, parentheses, albums, worth of material based off of the discussions we literally had while hanging out on the bar, the patio bar. I'm excited to work with him, and I never, ever would have had that opportunity. I never would have created that relationship had I not inserted myself into those that situation, maximized that chance opportunity. When you see an opportunity, you absolutely maximize it. Which means taking the business cards that you got, and I have them all sitting here on my desk, and I'm going through them, sending out emails. Hey, it was nice to meet you. I would love to help you out. What can I do for you? 
not hey my music's great we'll we'll, we'll talk we'll talk all, more about that kind of stuff in a later episode but going to PMC going to the road rally if you're if you're uh, if you're wanting getting into games you know go to a game jam if you have local meetups in in your area and they're probably close by i would say you live within driving distance of some kind of networking opportunity and it does take some courage i get that i totally get that believe it or not kind of a closet introvert i know i know my wife doesn't really believe that either but um i i i definitely like to keep to myself but i also kind of know how to be gregarious and outgoing and talk to folks and all of that or going jumping into some of these facebook groups lots of really good facebook groups the perspective facebook group is one uh dan graham's facebook group is another one um, music library composers and just being around other folks and who knows you you might find hey we're looking for music for this or that and so maximizing that opportunity seeing it, noticing it, and then really following up, doing the legwork, and um, responding in time, all of those kind of things. And I like the second part of this as well, which says adopting a relaxed attitude to life and being open to new experiences. This is a, this is a big one. This is a big one. Because I think you just have to, some of it's kind of go with the flow, just go with the flow, be easy to work with, be, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak, but just really have this kind of laid back, relaxed attitude, which I think is inherent in the write, submit, forget, repeat mantra that Dean Crepain talks about in his book of the same, same name which is you write, you submit, but then you forget about it. Just be relaxed about it. Don't obsess. Don't get your anxiety worked up about it. Just relax. Be open to new experiences. Say yes to things that maybe you wouldn't necessarily have said yes to. Because you never know. You never know who you're going to meet by saying yes to that thing, by going to that dinner. You never you never know what that what that relationship or what relationship could bud out of a chance encounter. And if you're just always saying no to things because maybe they're a little outside of your comfort zone and believe me, I totally get that. But if you're always always saying no to things, then you never get the opportunity to say yes. Because it, it kind of becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in a bad way where new things aren't coming at you because you keep saying no to things. It's kind of like if you keep turning your friend's invitation to go out, then eventually they'll probably stop asking. And then maybe the universe works in that same way. Do you keep saying no to the universe? then maybe it'll stop asking. I don't know. That feels really dark and hopeless, and I don't mean it that way. But it seems like, quote-unquote, lucky people can maximize when a chance encounter occurs because they have inserted themselves and they've positioned themselves to be ready to maximize that chance encounter. So when you do have the meeting, when you do bump into somebody, have a conversation in a grocery line, and you shake hands with somebody at a conference, or virtually through a Facebook group, or the, the PMA Zoom Hangouts. I've made, absolutely made connections through the Zoom Hangouts that they do at the Production Music Association. I think they call them coffee hours. And we are 
in Zoom rooms, right? And we're all there. We're watching kind of the presentation. And then they will break us out into breakout groups, which is, you know, six or seven folks kind of in a, in a little Zoom room by themselves and talking and sharing. And I have one uh, fellow composer I met who is amazing, who I just saw in the Zoom room. And I thought, I want to know that guy. There's just a, there's a good energy about him. And I want to know him. And we've become friends. We met up at the PMC in LA. And we're going to be doing more together. He joined the 52 Q's community. All because I just saw him and thought, he looks like someone who I want in my life on some level. Conversely, or I should say, additionally, on a separate one of those PMC uh, or those uh, PMA Zoom groups was sitting there with a library that I had worked with before and the relationship had just kind of cooled off a little bit. You know how it goes. You, you write some things and it, there's a lot of energy and then it just kind of cools off. You know, they don't have necessarily any, any need for what you do well, but he was sitting there. And so... Um, I said, hey, it's really good to see you again. I, I would love to, to reconnect. And he says, well, I'm going to be in LA. Let's, uh, let's connect. And we did. And we sat down, we had coffee, and he ordered a whole other album on top of more future projects. All because I went to the Zoom hangout that the PMA puts together rekindled the spark of a relationship, which parenthetically, that relationship started through a taxi listing some four or five years earlier. And now we're off. I've, I've met him in, in person. We've, we've, uh, we've, we've, actually been in the same, you know, space together. And there's just, there's just something really, really that happens when you have, you know, a handshake and, and you're sitting across from somebody. And I'm going to be talking, like I said, I'm going to be talking much more about that because when I come back from the road rally, I'm going to kind of do a, uh, a postmortem on production music conference and the road rally, my experiences, what I've learned from both of those. So I'm waiting to go to both before I unpack all of those. But my rekindling of that relationship with the library started from a chance encounter from going to the, uh, the, the Zoom hangout, the PMA coffee hours. And it just so happens that we were in the same breakout room because there's probably, you know, 100 people like in the big Zoom room. And then they break them out into, like I said, six, seven, maybe eight folks in one so that you can talk because 100 people can talk on Zoom at the same time. And there he was. So, does principle number one maximize chance opportunities? You absolutely have agency in this. You just have to be brave and you have to position yourself to do that. All right, principle number two listen to lucky hunches. Listening to lucky hunches. Dr. Wiseman says, lucky people make effective decisions by listening to their intuition and gut feelings. In addition, they take steps to actively boost their intuit uh, intuitive abilities by, for example, meditating and clearing their mind of other thoughts. Listening to your lucky hunches. And, and Nearly every composer that, that I've worked with, whether it's through Full Sail, whether it's through 52 Qs, or just outside of all of that, nearly every composer has an intuition that is trustworthy. Because if they're composers and want to compose, then chances are they've been around music for a really long time. They know what sounds good. What's missing is just maybe the mechanics of working a DAW or the education of understanding how production cues are put together. And, and all of that is all learnable, all learnable. Intuition is tougher to teach 
But thankfully, most students have really good intuition. They just don't know how to get there. They don't know how to, to maximize that. And so listening to those lucky hunches, listening to those gut feelings, I've lost count the number of times in a lesson where I've given feedback to the student and said, mm, you should probably think about doing this. And they said, ah, I was going to do it, but I didn't because dot, dot, dot. So trust those gut feelings. Trust, trust that intuition because it's probably right. You've been around music your whole life. You probably consume or have consumed a large amount of music. You've probably listened to soundtrack after soundtrack, watched TV, and just, just to listen to the music. You've probably absorbed all kinds of YouTube channels and YouTube videos and podcasts. Heck, I'm probably one of them. I do the exact same thing. Look at my YouTube history and it's my watch history is all like tutorials and videos and and uh, how to be a better composer, how to be a better producer, how to how to be better in the music business, all of those things. See, those are all steps that you can take to boost your intuitive abilities. It's essentially educating yourself. Educate yourself not not just in like music theory and how to work the logic. I mean, those are great. But talking like this very podcast, this very episode is helping you boost your intuitive abilities. And listen and trust it. That can be tough to do, especially if, if you've been beat up in the process. I mean, it's tough to, you know, we keep talking about taxi. It's tough to keep pitching to taxi if you keep getting returns. That's tough. Not only, you know, because you're out five bucks <laughs> and you don't get forwarded and you don't, you know, get in the hands of other libraries. Not only that, but, you know, your ego really takes a beating. And I totally get it. Believe me. Believe me. Do I get it? But don't let that undermine what you feel in in your 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 gut what what your intuition is telling you take away and this is what we'll talk about in principle 4 in turning bad luck to good you know take away what you can what you can learn from it but understand what part was mm, i i kind of disagree with this or my intuition was right, but I executed it poorly. The other thing that um, Dr. Wiseman talks about is meditating, clearing your mind of other thoughts. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this. I need to do it more consistently, admittedly. But meditating, clearing your mind of other thoughts is pretty important. And it's part of the reason I get up at four o'clock nearly every day because it's part of my miracle morning. And I've talked about miracle morning on the, on the channel before, but part of it is because that morning time allows me to kind of clear out energy, clear my thoughts and be ready to take on, uh, take on the day and, and, and it's boosting my intuitive abilities. I feel creatively more charged in the morning. In the book, The Artist's Way, I think it's Julie Cameron wrote that book, I believe. Uh, she talks about m journaling and writing stream of consciousness three pages every day in journaling. And the idea of this isn't to necessarily, you know, um, document your day as much as it is a, a mental and emotional cleansing, if you will. Just kind of brain dump, closing, uh, closing any open loops, getting it out of your out of your consciousness and in on, onto the paper. And the process of doing that clears your mind and allows that instinct, those hunches, to be more clearly heard. 
And that's what I find in the morning. I mean, it's 7 a.m. and I'm recording the podcast because I, I've been up since four o'clock. I've already gone on. I did a two mile walk this morning. I'm already halfway through my, my first cup of coffee and I'm, I'm ready to go. And I'm nearly half an hour into recording this episode. And we're only on number two. I guess we're going to go long today. That's because waking up, clearing my thoughts, and allowing, allowing my intuition to have as much space as possible. Is that, is that making sense? But trusting your lucky hunches. Trusting, you know, if we, we go back to, to, to point number one, which is maximizing chance opportunities, but trusting your hunch of what is a good opportunity. Going to the PMC conference. That was a good opportunity. Not, I guess, a week after I booked my hotel for the production music conference, did I get invited to speak at the Taxi Road Rally, to be on a panel. I'm going to be on a panel. I'm going to be doing mentoring sessions and doing a class. So I was invited not, not a week after I had committed to going to LA. And I thought to myself originally, you know, I thought, oh man, I'm going to LA twice in six weeks. It's really expensive, like flights and hotels and all of that. And, and, um, and I initially kind of was on the, on the, on the fence about it. I'm like, ah, no, I don't, I don't think I can afford it. But I said, yes, because my hunch tells me, my lucky hunch tells me, my intuition, my gut tells me that going to the road rally is going to be a good experience. For me as a composer, for me in my nascent publishing side of life, for me as a community developer, for 52 Qs. Because you bet your butt, I'm going to be wearing 52 Q swag the whole week. That's me trusting that intuition that I should go. Not only that, but it's not every day you get asked to speak at a at a major industry conference like that so why would i why would i say no to that a plane ticket and hotel seems to pale in comparison to the benefits that could that could render also see number 1 being open to new experiences Yep, going to LA twice in six weeks, flying through LAX, all of that, getting an Uber, you know, into a downtown LA. Yep. Talk about new experiences. So listening to those lucky hunches, paying attention to them, making effective, effective decisions by, again, not being afraid of new things, trusting this is going to be good for me, and taking steps to maximize those things. I think those are all in play here. Absolutely. All right, so let's look at principle number three. Principle number three is expect good fortune. Expect good fortune. Dr. Wiseman says, lucky people are certain that the future is going to be full of good fortune. These expectations become self-fulfilling prophecies by helping lucky people persist in the face of failure and shape their interactives with others in a positive way. I wholeheartedly believe this. In fact, I mean, it's, it ties into how I sign off on nearly every podcast episode, which is, I know that the universe has great plans for you. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I expect 
good things to happen. Do they always happen? No. And it's not about being in denial, but it's about putting good energy out into the universe, but even more importantly, putting good energy into yourself. Putting good energy, speaking good energy into yourself in an affirmative way to say, you know what, things are going to work out. And if this thing isn't happening, then I'm going to trust that there's going to be something else. Again, I know that's easy to say. (laughs) Very harder to do. But the inverse of that is living in worry and anxiety and always like, ah, oh, I'm a failure, blah. And, and that's, friends, that's, that is not sustainable. That is just, for, for me, it feels like just emotional sludge on, you know, on an ocean, on an ocean bird. I don't know. I just got a picture of like an oil spill and, you know, you have like the ducks come out and stuff and they've got like all the oil on them and, and that kind of negative reinforcement into, into your, into your own self just becomes those things. And so it's, it's going to be hopeless to fly if you're covered in that, that self doubt in that just negativity just sticks on you. Well, I should say it sticks on me big time. So, yeah, I always try to be a positive person. And again, it's not about denial. You know, I'm not, you know, I've had my share of, of, of uh, close calls, of bad luck, as it were. But expecting, expecting good things to happen. When they don't, disappointment, maybe even anger, frustration, those are all those are all okay. But when I put something out into the world, when I submit a cue, expect good things. And I'm proof that they kind of start returning. Not always. I'm not fooling myself, but You take number one, principle number one, then principle number two, and it it feeds into these things. And by expecting good things to happen, because I've maximized my chance opportunities, and I'm listening to those lucky hunches that when I go to submit something, when I go to put something out into the universe, into a library, I'm expecting it to be okay. I'm expecting it to succeed. Because the other part of this is persisting in the face of failure. So even when something goes sideways, what's, what's the takeaway? What do you learn from this? And that peeking ahead to principle number four, but helping you persist. I mean, this industry, the entire entertainment industry is full of people who just never gave up up. In my interview with Jesse Josephson, he talked he talked about the waiting room. How at the beginning of their career, you know, there's the waiting room is full of everybody wanting to get in on the production music bandwagon. It's full of people in the waiting room, but one by one, those folks either they don't see success quick enough or they 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 don't have the stamina for it and they they drop off. Very rarely is anyone in any creative industry an overnight success. Persistence is a a through line to nearly every successful person. Well, in general, but especially in the entertainment industry. You know, every time, every time I see the new cast of SNL pop up, you know, you have this fresh young face who you've never heard of. Come to find out, like they've been a stand up for five or six years. 
and they've bombed on stage or they have this amazing YouTube channel or something like that and do amazing impressions because they've just been persisting. And you just hear about them and you think, oh man, they, they, I guess they just walked in off the street and did an audition for Lorne and made it happen. But in reality, there's been years and years of persistence that we don't see. So when you see somebody like me on YouTube talking about success, just know that there's a whole origin story, years, decades in the making that you just don't really see. The Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours concept is absolutely true. I believe in it. And so by expecting good fortune, by expecting positive, good outcomes and persisting when they don't happen, not only are you going to be able to keep at it, but that, I don't know, I, I feel like that becomes infectious in some way. And you suddenly start surrounding yourself, or rather, I should say, you start gathering to yourself like-minded individuals, folks who, who also expect good things, also positive and persistent. And suddenly, before you know it, you have a community of people all pointed in the same direction, all sharing knowledge, sharing love and encouragement, not, you know, not false hope, not just, you know, blowing sunshine, you know, just because I'm afraid to offend an internet stranger or whatever, but it's all about pointing positivity to a, 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 a tangible end and not negativity. You know, I got to tell you, when, when I was watching American Idol in the heyday, in the, uh, the Randy, Paula, and Simon era, who I resonated the most with, well, while Simon Cowell was entertaining, and I appreciated his candor, who I resonated with was Paula Abdul. Because her ultimate outlook was about positivity. It was about putting goodness and good things out into the world. Could she be a little, a little too soft-handed? Probably. And I, like I said, I did appreciate Simon's honesty, but that's not how I'm going to provide feedback for folks. I don't. I think ultimately that's that's a that's that's a, a dead end. You're just you're putting negativity out there. It's entertaining. It's fun to watch, but it's not sustainable. I don't think anybody would suffer a long life a lifetime relationship around a person like that. That's my feeling. And certainly nobody's going to listen to an hour-long podcast from somebody just, yeah, yeah. Even though I know, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Toxicity does, can, can be a currency in social media and in algorithmically driven media like YouTube. And some of my, some of my highest viewed videos are where I kind of got loose, whether it's getting loose on Avid <laughs> or getting loose on Waves or whatever. And I get that because sometimes you're frustrated and that's okay. You're allowed to be frustrated. But ultimately, my base, baseline emotion tends and bends towards positivity and expecting the best out of people out of situations, and then when those things don't happen, persistence. Be persistent, and you will gather around you. You will attract those who also are the same. Because, yeah, like, like I said, nobody wants to work long-term 
with somebody who's always negative. Nobody wants that kind of relationship. Well, I mean, I mean, romantically or professionally. That's tough to be around. But if you're positive, if you're upbeat, I don't mean just like bubbly person. That's what I'm talking about. If you have a, an upward view of life, of the profession, of the industry, people are going to want to work with you more. They just are. It's so much more enjoyable to be around people who are easy to be around, who are positive. Not fake, but ultimately the arc of, of, their, of their outlook bends towards the positive. So that's principle number three, expecting good fortune. And then finally, I want to talk about principle number four, turning bad luck to good. Turning bad luck to good. So principle four says, and Dr. Wiseman says, lucky people employ various psychological techniques to cope with and often even thrive upon the ill fortune that comes their way. For example, for example, they spontaneously imagine how things could have been worse. They don't dwell on the ill fortune and take control of the situation. And I got to tell you, friends, this is absolutely what we have to do as production music composers, as folks in the entertainment industry, where we're ultimately relying on someone else. You know, there, somebody else is the gatekeeper of what we do, whether it's a library, an editor, a music supervisor, or whatever. We're going to get rejection. How we cope with it, how we persist through it, is vital. So, when you get that taxi return, after you lick your wounds, tend to your bruised ego, I would be surprised if it didn't happen. What's the takeaway? Is the takeaway that all those taxi screeners are totally out of touch, they don't know what they're talking about, and screw those guys, I want a refund? Or is it, hmm, what did I miss? How did I miss and why did I miss? Now, it's entirely possible that the screeners were completely full of crap and they don't know what they're talking about. But it's probably more likely that there was some little detail that you missed because maybe you didn't <laughs> read the brief. <laughs> But what you do with rejection, what you do with bad luck, is almost as important with what you do when things go right, with the good luck. Because it's that, it's, it's, it's psychologically coping with, or even thriving upon, Dr. Wiseman says, what thriving upon those situations when they come side. Here, here's, an, here's an example. Uh, back in Memphis, I was the music department chair, and for seniors, they had to give a recital. And this is something that gets planned months and months ahead of time. They lock down venues, they lock down bands, and they it's super tightly scheduled and they have rehearsal slots and there's programs and announcements and all of this stuff. It's If you've ever put on a senior recital, you know that there are a ton of moving parts. And one of the one of the seniors, uh, I think a week, a week before her senior recital, her bass player drops out. Her bass player drops out. I think she was a worship leading student. So essentially a, a, a director, a music director. And her bass player drops out and she comes to me. You know, I'm the department chair, so she has to have permission. She wants to move her recital back by two weeks. 
to bring on a new bass player and and work them in. And I denied it. Not only because so many moving parts that it would have it would have created a cascading effect and potentially over uh, up, upturned the very very compact soil of all of that scheduling not only that although I, I feel like that was really secondary to the bigger lesson that she could learn and I actually told her I'm not sure if she if she got it at the time I do hope so Sarah, if you're watching this, I doubt you are. I'd love to hear if uh, if your perspective has changed on this. But I actually told her, you have a golden opportunity that no one else this year is going to get to learn. You're you're going to you're going to get an extra bonus lesson that everybody else gets to learn out there professionally in the real world, not in an academically relatively safe environment. And that is coping and overcoming these types of scheduling things because they happen all the time. All the time. And so Sarah got to learn that. And she did. She found a new bass player. She went on to have a stellar recital. And no one, no one was none, none the wiser because of it. Oh, wait, but now that, that sounds weird. No one really, you couldn't really tell. She did a great job. I'm sure there were many sleepless nights that week. And I'm sure part of her probably hated me a little bit for it. But I knew that she was going to succeed because she's very, very talented. And so I knew she'd be all right. Uh, uh, and, and I think what she didn't know, and I don't think I told her is, you know, the, the, the head of the base program, I think was ready to step in last minute. Should, should he need to, I believe that we have, we did have a safety net for her, but she didn't know that she didn't need it either. But she got the opportunity to learn that, that nobody else got. Nobody else had that chance. So when somebody, when when the, the graduates are out there in their churches, in their orchestra pits or whatever, and they have a professional show with people paying 50 bucks a ticket to see, you know, if it's a theater show, or whether you're in front of a mega church with 3,000 congregants and your bass player calls in sick the night before or the week before, there's a lot more on the line than a senior recital than a quantified numerical grade at the end of a semester. And again, I'm not sure she appreciated at the time, but I, I would love to think that she did. What can you take away from this? What can you learn about yourself, about your music if it's getting rejected, in realizing that every, every, every situation is an opportunity to grow in some some fashion. I feel like I, I do learn more from my rejections than I actually do the forwards, than I actually do placements, because I'm, I'm not necessarily growing. I recently had, had a rejection, and uh, I was like, I didn't understand it at all. I'm like, no, no, this isn't, nope, they're wrong. Urgh. But then when I read the brief a little closer, I realized, oh, that's, that's the thing I missed. So use your various psychological techniques to cope with and even thrive upon this ill fortune but don't dwell on it. Because when you change your thinking, you are wrestling back control of the situation. You're putting yourself in the position to have agency over it. So when you get a rejection, again, after you lick your ego wounds a little bit, 
once you walk away with this is this is what I learned, now you have agency. You have some control in that so that you can grow past that. And the next submission, you might not make that same mistake. Your takeaways, what are you learning? How are you how are you learning those things? The takeaway might be how to not let it stick on you. Learning to tamp down the ego, learning to tamp down the negativity so that you can persist and expect good fortune. It's hard to expect good fortune in the middle of failure. I get that. But having a failure provides the opportunity to expect good things in the future. Does that make sense? This might be all too like, you know, sunshine and rainbows and <laughs> whatever. But I believe it. I believe it. So those are the four principles of luck, according to Dr. Richard Wiseman. And I'll say them one more time. Maximize your chance opportunities. Listen to lucky hunches. That's principle number two. Principle number three, expect good fortune. And then finally, principle number four, turn your bad luck to good. But what about you? How do you deal with luck? Do you have any stories to share about how luck stepped in and fortune seemed to favor the bold and the brave. I would love to hear about it. Why don't you let me know in the comments below? I do read all those comments and I do make an effort to respond. Sometimes the comments come in uh, across multiple videos. And so I'm a little bit behind right now on my, uh, on my response, but I absolutely do read all of them. I would love, absolutely love to hear from you. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to hear a few words from Mrs. 52Q, Shannon Croft, who's going to tell us all about, all about the community and about how you can join. And when we return, we are going to be listening to Sleeping Baby, which is a piano lullaby cue written by Yuka Reschke. Hey, y'all. I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52Q's podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52Q's isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52Q's community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com.
That was Sleeping Baby Baby by Yuka Yuka Reski. Thank you so much for submitting this. This was submitted for our week 39 feedback thread. And uh, I, I really, I really like Yuka's playing and uh, really lo love this cue. It absolutely captures that that feeling, that lullaby feeling, really solid melodic writing. And, and with when you're writing lullabies, Everything has to be so, the melodies can't be too busy. They can't be too, like, they can't really go super wide uh, dynamic ranges, super, super wide, um, you know, octaves. And so we have to be really, really careful because, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, sleeping music. And so I think we've done a really good job with that, with this rather. Um, my, my main takeaway is, is that the piano feels, and, 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 and I, it might be a really easy fix where we can grab all of our velocities and bring them way, 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 way down. It just feels a little too much like the attack of the piano is a little, it's a little bright and a little hard. It feels a little heavy handed. And so I think bringing all of our velocities down could help with that. Yeah, I, I, I feel like like each hammer is, is, is kind of striking each string a little too hard and um, it just feels a little aggressive and so I think we could probably like I said grab all of those velocities and bring them all all way down and the other thing we can do I think is probably automate some tempo fluctuations and I and I know I know in production music world it's supposed to be nope the same tempo keep the tempo don't ever change the tempo but when we're dealing with a lullaby cue, I think we can we can kind of stretch the tempo just just a little bit here, like like going into into this uh, kind of our middle section. Dun, dun, dun. And we, it feels like we almost kind of hinted at "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." I think that's really clever. And I wonder also if we can maybe kind of ripple some of those notes. Bring. I'm not a pianist, but just kind of ripple those. Bring. Just so they're not quite right on top of each other. And so also, uh, depending on your quantization, it feels a little, little too much on the grid. This is something that stretching the tempo will help with, but it feels a little, little too locked in. Like when you hear the two, the two notes hit at one time. Here they're like right on top of each other. Yeah, and I, I think having having some some stretchy tempo having the velocities way down so that it feels a little bit more intimate you know um, as far as just the closeness of the piano uh, and the softness of the piano and ease the quantization strength I think is really gonna help help that not quite feel so so rigid and it's, it's a fine line though it's a fine line. Um, to something sounding organic and, and human versus an error, like timing errors, which is why I always hard quantize and then ease my quantization strength. And then if I need to, if I need to go in specifically and like hand move some things, I will. But uh, in general, I hard quantize. I love this middle section, how you went up the octave, 100%. Love that. So it's kind of we took our, our both hands and moved them up to the uh, to the, the the upper end of the piano, and I think that works really well.
And, and we probably could have given a little bit more space before we, re we returned to our, our opening motif. Boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And then the last thing I'll say also about velocities is really having the, the idea of the velocities kind of ebbing and flowing and kind of breathing. So, so we would have, let me get my, my pen tool here. Oops. And then kind of back down a, a little bit. So we would increase the velocities, so it's growing, and then kind of coming back down. Building, and then bringing the velocities back down again. Just so, it's just so that it's breathing. And, uh, and I think, I think that in the, uh, in the world of lullabies, you want that methodical kind of you want you want to musically rock back and forth and so having that that organic timing stretch and um, also the the velocities kind of breathing in and out as well now as far as the end let me uh, back that up a little bit And I would end on the tonic. Mm, we ended on the third. Let's go. Um, maybe bum bum, and end on that kind of that low note. End on that tonic. But you could thank you so much. Thank you so much for being uh, such a valuable member of the community. And thank you for submitting this cue. Like I said, this was uh, submitted during the week 39 check-in. We do weekly feedback threads every single week at 52 Qs. And if that's something that you're interested in, then why don't you head over to 52 Qs and and uh, and join? It's it's free. And if you liked that feedback and you would like more feedback on your own cues, where I unpack things like the music theory side of things, the form structure, the harmonic analysis, titles, mix, master, all of that, then uh, you can check out that along with one on one services, mastermind, over at 52 Qs dot com slash coaching. I would love, I would love to continue and uh, to help you reach your production music career goal. But that's going to do it for us for this week's episode of the 52 Qs podcast. Next week, I am going to be joined by none other than my publisher for, uh, for CBS Sports and also for Discovery Channel, Rob Astor of RR Hot Publishing. He is going to be joining me and he is going to be talking all about sports broadcasting cues and unpacking the seven types of cues that get used for sports. So you don't want to miss that, but that's going to do it for me for today. Once again, a huge, huge thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep all of this going. The least you can do is uh, stick around to the end of the video and watch their name fly by, I guess is over here, fly by really super fast. Um, but thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you had a fantastic week 39. And I know that your week 40 is, is going great. How do I know that friends? Because I know that the universe has amazing plans for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022 Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com.